Rendered meshes in my voxel game used to look like this. With the right lighting, you could just about make out what they were, but without the right lighting, well, let's just say it could be better. As a result of this, this month I decided that the time had come to occlude. Unfortunately though, this was not as straightforward as a job as you might think. I ended up writing my own custom mesh file type, a new export pipeline system, and moved around a bunch of code, all to get ambient occlusion working, and some other stuff I'll talk about in a moment. But it does look much better now. This is a game about exploration and discovery in a procedurally generated high fantasy world. You explore, collect things, level up, all in a gameplay loop that's designed to fit quite well onto a mobile device. But included in this gameplay model is also non-procedural places. No algorithm was used to make these places, only my brain. These locations are generally where the story takes place, so there's gonna be quite a few of them. So, set the scene. You explore around your procedural world. You walk into a new chunk and see in the distance a town. You head towards it, click visit, and there it is. But then this would beg the question, why does it look so absolutely brain dead vegetable edition? Well, the answer is because I haven't actually touched this part of the code since the start of the year. So it's entered the pain cave. I got a few different things done this month, but let's start with ambient occlusion in all of the models. Essentially, it's a technique to simulate minor shadows in an environment, and this helps make outlines of boundaries more obvious. This is a game based around voxels, so actually that allows me to make a lot of assumptions. My implementation of ambient occlusion is based on this article where you determine neighbor voxels for each vertice and then just darken it accordingly. All this was already implemented in the shaders from the lot of the train work I'd already done, but the complicated thing was actually getting it over to work with regular meshes. My engine is based on Ogre 3D for graphics, uh, which is an open source rendering library which manages pretty much most of the graphics for me. It also includes its own mesh format and parser, which importantly is not actually built with voxels in mind. A voxel vertice will always conform to a whole number for a position value, which is the opposite to regular meshes which can be positioned anywhere at all. Voxel normals will always conform to one of six different values, which is of course one for each side of a cube, which is different from a regular vertice normal, which can essentially have one of like infinite number of values. Also for this game, I've constrained it to a color palette of only 256 values, because I don't really need that many. Whereas at the moment, I'm using just regular floating point UVs to map onto a texture which contains the color palette. So let's add that up. Each vertice defines three floats for X, Y, and Z. Each vertice defines three floats for X, Y, and Z for normals, and each vertice defines two floats for texture UV coordinates. So that's eight floats in total, four bytes to define a single float. So that comes to 32 bytes just to define a single entry. And then also bear in mind that each face of a voxel uses four vertices. And this is the inefficiency I'm talking about. And I also have nowhere really to pass my calculated ambient occlusion values when generating these meshes. Now let's talk a bit about what I could do if I was to use my own custom mesh format. If I was able to store each of the position values into one of 256 values, then that would mean I'd be able to store each position axis into a single byte. As well as this, if voxel textures was constrained to one of 256 values, which currently it is, then I'd be able to store that into a single byte as well. So that's four bytes for what is equivalent to like the value of one float. Because computers love prime numbers, if I was to double this to be eight bytes, then I'd have all this extra space in order to store any other stuff I needed. This could be for things like special voxels, say if I want to give the character a special eye so I can animate blinking, or if I want to have an extra color palette, or if I want to have some voxels like marked so that they can do a, a vertice animation in shaders, like for instance, um, the leaves of a tree move, but the trunk doesn't move. That's all possible here. So it's great to have that extra space. So if we now take into account that I now have only eight bytes per vertice, compared to the 32 before, that gives me a reduction of four times. So to summarize, this work wasn't just about ambient occlusion, it was also about making quite a big optimization of file size and bringing my own mesh flexibility into existence. The first step to getting all this implemented was to set up all the classes I needed to get Ogre 3D to behave. I'll gloss over most of this because it's boring, but believe me, it took quite a while. I mostly just copy and pasted the regular mesh serializer over until I could pass a file type, which I named VoxMesh. Very creative. See this plane here? It was completely passed and loaded using my own custom mesh approach, even though it was just a copy and paste job of the existing Ogre code at this point. So now, with the mesh infrastructure falling into place, I needed to think about packing the bits I wanted into my binary file. Previously, I'd used a Python script to convert between a .obj file and a human readable .mesh.xml file. 
the Ogre's export tool could turn into a native mesh. This was all done in my asset pipeline that takes a .gox file and outputs a .mesh file. This was massively convoluted though, taking about five different steps to complete and it also had caused me problems before. However, I could skip this entire process with a command line utility that can take in a TXT file and just spit out a vox mesh format. I would have to do the voxelation by myself, but also I could just take the implementation from the game, so actually it's not that difficult. I chose to switch to C++ from Python for this tool, um, firstly because speed, and secondly because actually dealing with raw bits and bytes in C++ is just way easier. It works in a sort of pipeline approach, so it passes a text file, resolves hex colors to palette colors, determines which faces are visible, and then pushes the faces to an intermediate data structure. That's important because in future I plan a series of optimizations here. Once faces are resolved, if they can be merged together, then you can start getting some pretty massive improvements. The average model probably contains twice as many faces as necessary at the bare minimum. The good news is face merging algorithms are quite straightforward and should provide pretty immediate improvements. All this generation is done offline compared to things like the train voxelization, which is done during gameplay on the user's device. It's in my interest to get the smallest possible mesh, so in this case an expensive algorithm can actually be justified. There's also the option to discard faces based on parameters like the normal values. For instance, this is the current model used to generate trees in the overworld. The average generated map has about a thousand of these, and they're rendered twice for the regular pass and again for the shadow pass. Face merging could reduce the tree from this many vertices to about this many. As well as this, discarding faces could say something like well, you never actually see the bottom of the tree, so just remove any downwards facing faces. And then it would look like this, which again is still a pretty significant reduction if you're going to be drawing thousands of these. These two methods of optimization could massively reduce the number of faces, and the best part is once it's implemented, everything that uses the pipeline will get to benefit from it. The thing is though, I spent most of this month just getting the infrastructure in place, so I'll have to do it some other time. But probably when I get around to implementing Android support, so Vox meshes were getting populated by this new export tool, now I just had to make them work in the engine. This actually took quite a bit of fiddling, but general trial and error got the job done. However, these changes did highlight some issues that had been in the code base for quite a while. So you're gonna get ambient occlusion on all characters. Oh. My. F God. <laughs> no, what's happened to you? They're all in pain. Oh well, well, okay, it sort of worked. It didn't blow up. So the thing about the meshes being like the wrong way around was quite easy to fix. I just hadn't really flipped them like I had in my previous Python script. The colors was really the main problem though. It took me a while to find it, but my snippet to produce UV texture coordinates from a voxel index had actually been broken from the very start. I ended up having to put a debug marker in one of the generation scripts to actually find this out. It ended up being caused by some brackets and casting being in the wrong place. And to be honest, I think that's pretty much every programming bug ever. All I actually had to do was change the location of some brackets and it just sort of came back to life. Once all this stuff was out of the way, it was pretty clear to see how much of a difference the addition of ambient occlusion made to the actual rendered scene. They just had far more detail and were better to look at all round. Of course, there was a lot that went into it for just that one effect, but really I've laid a good amount of groundwork for the future. And the thing about reducing mesh sizes might sound kind of trivial, but something like this bone mesh item was coming out at six 64 kilobytes when converted to a mesh, which for a game about having lots of collectibles is just not really acceptable. The thing is that in the code yet, the actual bit about shrinking the file size isn't actually implemented yet. I've still got all the padding that I've had in it for a, quite a while in order to get it to work with the current Ogre system. I'm gonna have to overwrite some other classes in order to get that stuff to work. The difficult bit is just sort of figuring out how to do that because I haven't done it before. Um, but it can definitely be done, I just need to find the time to do it, is all. So finally, to wrap the rest of this up, all I had to do was the arbitrary port and test to other platforms. I'll spare you the details of writing a C++ build system, but just make sure, if you write a dynamically loaded module, you make sure to have the same defines and config values across the two binaries. Otherwise, it'll link fine when you load it in dynamically, but then it'll just blow up in a bunch of dumb, stupid ways that then is going to make it really difficult to debug later down the line. So with the Vox Mesh a success, it was now time to move on to one of the most important parts of this project. Unironically, the level editor. It used to look like this, now it looks like this. It's mostly there. Again, completely own engine. You've essentially got to write your own tools, blah, 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 blah. You've heard it before. The difference between this and some of the other editors I've written is that this one is actually written in engine like you would just a regular game. 
using squirrel scripts. So it's completely an engine and what you see is what you get. This just makes it way more flexible and modular and it's just better performing as a result. I'm writing it in a way that future projects will be able to make use of it as well um, because it's just written in these generic framework packages. So for instance, I have a framework that's just able to edit scene trees and that's really all it does. I then stick it together in another project and I essentially just use it like you would in another library. So that way I can edit my voxel train in the same editor, even though that is of course unique specifically to this project. Now one of the problems with the voxel train was it was slow to generate because it was still implemented in script. This made editing time consuming and visiting a place in game also took longer than it needed to. With my new plugin architecture I was able to move all of this stuff over to C++ and speed it up pretty massively as a result. I now pass visited location files in C++, turn it into a native data structure and then pass that to a native terrain voxelizer. This did take quite a bit of time but the performance improvement was massive and was worth the time investment as I ended up with roughly about 100 times faster compared to what the previous system used to be. This voxelizer specifically was built for terrains for visited locations, but what I also decided to do was move my generic voxelizer over to C++ as well. So this is one that just takes like an array of data which tells you which colours it is and then spits a mesh out the other end. I plan to use this for things like character customization. Um, and possibly some other found items, maybe. Um, but, you know, I'm gonna need it either way, and the performance improvement, again, was pretty significant as a result. And here's an example of how much improved it was. This might be quite painful to do on the native implementation, so let's see. So it took three seconds on native. So that implies it's probably gonna take about 30 seconds outside of native. I mean, that's a lot of cubes. I don't actually want to do this on the non-native implementation because I know it's just going to break, but I'll do it for the views. So get ready, boys. Okay, this, I'm not doing it anymore. So then with this native terrain voxelizer in place, editing on the terrain suddenly became nice. So now let's talk about the other improvements I made to the scene editor. The main thing was the addition of this new GUI framework. A problem I often had was that I often wanted to do things like toolbars or pop-ups or movable windows and some of the other tools I've written, but I had no real way to do that. The engine's exposure of GUI objects is actually quite straightforward. Like there's no way to do draggable windows. When you create a window, it's just like a panel that has stuff rendered into it. So in order to get all these like nice usability things in place, I kind of had to write it myself. Basically, it's a simple re-implementation of a lot of things that something like MGUI would do for you. I'll be able to incorporate it into other tools I write, such as this material editor I made about two years ago. It took just under a week to get the initial system working and it quickly showed its use when I integrated it into the scene editor. Here's a quick overview of all of the things I added to the scene editor this month and there's quite a few of them. Terrain editing is way faster due to the native voxelizer. Raycasting terrain has been fixed, so no more off-center terrain modifications. I, I did write my own raycasting algorithm for this actually, but um, it was based on the thin matrix one. The GUI framework was incorporated and it supports toolbars, windows, pop-ups and will later also support things like right-click dialogue. Actions have now been implemented which is a big deal so you can do things like undo and redo transformation and terrain manipulation actions. This is just a must-have to be honest it wasn't really a proper editor tool without it. You can raycast select objects. There's now designated scale and position gizmos and you can just switch between them. Object properties can be entered manually using the new vector 3 widget I've written as part of the GUI work. Uh, that's a widget that also only takes things like numbers or floating point numbers. Window positions and sizes are saved to disk, so any layout is remembered. The main thing that's still missing is reliable modifications to the scene tree. That might be a time consuming one, but I've decided from now on I'm going to get stuff like this implemented when I actually need it. No more writing level editors before the game is in development like the last one. I just did the classic waterfall error of feature scoping something that ended up not being fit for purpose. Anyway, the editor is now much better, which is necessary for the game's success. We'll get to the gameplay stuff quite soon. Finally, let's talk about a small thing. I've architected this special setup function into the designated few functions that the engine supports in the initial squirrel script that it passed. Basically what this is going to do is it will get called before the engine has done any of the setup stuff. So before a window is created or the graphic system is initialized, 
or like pretty much anything is done. It's like a, a very early stage of the engine setup, earlier than the start function. Basically, it's all about config setup. And to be honest, I've needed something like this for quite a long time. Like, I want to make sure that there's flexibility in the engine, so I don't want to have to hard code like, oh, you have to be using this. Um, I want it to be as much done in scripts as I possibly can. So that's largely what this enables. One of the main things that made me like push to want to get this sold recently was that um, the project setup file would specify a window size, so the engine would create the window of that size. But then pretty much as soon as the game started, the game script code would request it to go full screen. So what you ended up with was this often like weird flicker effect where um, it, it was like kind of this white box in the screen. The fact that I've been able to do that means that now when you start the game up on Windows, it just sort of starts, like it appears full screen and starts rendering straight away. I now build debug and release builds for the game for Linux something which might sort of add a bit more performance if you're using a device like the Steam Deck because the debug build is a bit slow. I had a spring clean of my repos with more of them being migrated over to GitHub including the engine's official documentation. The Linux build now has that crashing issue fix where you used to not be able to visit places. Um, that was due to some file read write issues which is now completely gone with the C++ implementation. So I'm pretty pleased about that. So that's going to wrap it up for this month. Um, quite a lot has actually happened, but I think it's quite difficult to kind of portray on the video how much has actually happened because a lot of it really is just technical stuff. Like, I make massive progress each month, but I think um, as time goes on, I gradually realise how much work is actually needed for this entire thing. It's just that uh, it, it, it all comes down to time. It's just time. Time is the enemy. It really is. Talking about exciting times. Right. Android phones. So I used to not own Android phones. Uh, I'm just obviously a massive Apple simp. Uh, so I didn't have an Android phone. So I've got two Android phones, but they're all like secondhand bangers off uh, eBay. So they are about, you know, 80 pounds for the two of them. Uh, so that's good. Um, I checked that both of them support Vulcan. So, so I've got this Acer laptop. It's a lovely, um, this is actually what got me through university. I've also acquired this other laptop uh, from a friend. Oh no, it's a Dell. Okay, there we go, Dell laptop. Now you might be thinking, what's the point in that? The answer is, when I ran the game on my parents' laptop, their new one back home, there was an issue where all the trees in the scene were like flickering in and out of existence. Um, so it's actually very important to try it on a different uh, variety of hardware. The intention is to build like a stress rack, so have different computers that run the automated tests over and over again, and just see how that goes. But that'll be like probably for the future. Anyway, onwards and upwards.